the circumcision. We worship God in spirit. Not in the flesh. To be bringing sounds from heaven. And yet we are bringing those sounds in the gyration of demonic spirits. you are praying make sure you are praying ole kabele na na kobela da shaka palata le poria na kobela de na o kapala parata otele manada akapala ka otele kabela ta le poria na kobe Somebody pray now, Kabela de Kobela. The Somebody is not praying. Somebody is looking around. Open your mouth and travel. Great travel, travel. For you shall be called the repairer of the bridge, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. For you shall build the ancient waste places, the places that have been abandoned for many generations. You are the repairer, you are the restorer, you are the builder. Oh, priest of the Lord, oh, priest of the Lord, open your mouth and pray. Open your mouth and pray. He said, Papa. The waste places of my family. I stand as a repairer. The waste places of my ministry. I stand as a repairer. The waste places of my marriage. I stand as a repairer. Oh my God, the Beleno. Kale, Yoti Paraska, Niscabo de Beli, Yagodu, Gubila de Kode. I don't care for how long it has been wasted. A priest arises. A priest arises. I don't care for the number of generations that it has been wasted. I arise a priest tonight. I arise a priest tonight. A priest. That can build the ancient ruins, that can restore broken parts. Shire, Shire, the quarter, the quarter, the quarter, the quarter, the quarter, the quarter, the quarter. Every ancient ruin in my family, every old ruin in my family. I rise a priest tonight. I rise a priest tonight. I rise a priest tonight. Every desolation that my generation has suffered, 
I rise and preach tonight. de balada balado.
sister arise turn on your toga of priesthood and wage war wage war wage war wage war they shall repair they shall repair the ruined cities the desolations of many generations ay 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 your mouth if you like don't cry every wastage of the devil every land in my family that the devil has made a wasteland I arise as a priest of the most high I repair I repair I repair. I repair. Oh, Lema. Every wilderness must become a fruitful field. Every dry ground must be full with water. I repair. I repair. My garden must be water. My plants do not die. My seeds do not die. My fruits are not delayed. I bear fruit. I bear fruit, I bear fruit, I bear fruit, my seed cannot die. Woman of God, your seed are under attack and your mouth is closed. Can you pray? Holy Bio, Bio, Pelo, Kenya, Yano, Ya, Kobel, Ladia, Kobelai, Kobelano, Holy Moses. Holy Ghost, wow! Come oh, that devil is a liar. That devil is a liar. Hold it, 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 warfare you don't know the meeting has shifted that's why you are casual that's why you are looking around pray every west city every west land let the waters of the spirit water the land you must bear fruit Yes, on site online. Make sure you are praying. You have a few more minutes. Open your mouth. You are not praying for the pastor. You are not praying for the, the person by your side now. Leave that hand you are holding and pray for your family. Pray for your business. Pray for your academics. Pray for your marriage. Wherever there is a wasteland. I arise a repairer, I arise a builder, I arise a restorer. Yeah, 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 yo. Ola Pele, Okopala, Keba, Keba, Koba, Luba, Lemu, Apa, Desi, Lanaba. <laughs> that devil is a liar. That devil is a liar. 
white man slept the enemy came and he saw he saw he saw I wish a young man would pray. That weakness you continue to suffer. That weakness you suffer. That spiritual weakness. Somebody said something. Every time you try to advance with God, it's as if there is no strength. It's a seed. It's a seed. It's a seed. Where are the priests that can uproot things? Where are the priests that can repair things? Somebody close your eyes and travel in the spirit. Go to ancient antiquity and begin to restore. Restore your bloodline. Restore, restore. Another priest did. Another priest cannot do it. What the priest of darkness arrange? And a priest of heaven, a priest of light, can scatter. What a priest of darkness scatter, a priest of light can repeal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Arise, oh priest of light. You have four more minutes to attack this matter. Every wasteland, every wasteland, in my family, in my business, in my academics, in my marriage, concerning my children, I command you, become a fruitful field, become a fruitful field. Ay, 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 ay. The Bible says, until the spirit be poured out, then the wilderness becomes a fruitful field. I feel fire. The fire on the altar is burning. Ole, shade bele kudi, and they shall repair. Hi, the ruined cities. They shall rebuild the old ruins. Where are the builders? Where are the repairs? Arise, O priest of Zion. says if the thief be caught he restores sevenfold he has stolen the health of your family everybody in your bloodline has cancer that thief is a bastard that thief must be caught tonight everybody in your family suffers from barrenness everybody in your family is struggling to marry tonight where is the priest of light where is the priest of light where Oh! 
Of the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities. I the desolations of many generations, desolations of many generations. Oh, Holy Ghost. These prayer points that we are praying tonight, God has deliberately allowed us to stumble upon the burden in his heart so that things that are lacking within our individual contexts, things that are lacking within our human space, might be addressed by the instrument of prayer. So I encourage you that when you get back home, sustain this prayer point. Sustain it. Sustain it. If you've been around since we started this series on priesthood, this is the ninth installment of this teaching. I have told you repeatedly over and over and again that things that happen in the natural are not products of chance. Things that happen in the natural are not products of happenstance. Every time you see a reality finding expression in the visible realm, an altar, a priest, a sacrifice, a temple, the system of priesthood is what has given birth to that reality. So for instance, when you see nudity on our streets, you see a generation in a mad rush to, to dress naked like prostitutes. It is the product of a priesthood. When you enter into a territory and you see that the territory is riddled by bloodshed and violence, it's the product of a priesthood. You walk into a territory and find out that almost every young person, it is a, there's a desperation to become useless. So people grow old, don't achieve anything with their lives and then they are still in their father's house 45, 50, 50 they call them old worry they are still there nothing good, he has slept with 15 women, has children everywhere it's not, it's not just human character and behavior it's something that has been powered by a priesthood 
where a master priest has found a way to give license to a spirit. So it is the same, like I have told you over and over. If righteousness will pervade the land, if holiness will be found upon the streets of eternity, if accurate worship centers, churches, buildings where Christians meet will arise within eternity, it will be the function of priesthood. So what happens in the invisible realm, what you cannot see with your eyes, the things that are behind the scenes is a war of priesthood. So the priesthood that wins is the priesthood that will govern. The priesthood that wins is the priesthood that will dictate the environment in which the human beings in that territory will find expression. So this is why as RCN, we pray the way we pray. We understand that there is an invisible war. And until accurate priests arise, it will look like there are many men on the earth and yet it seems as if God cannot establish his counsel in the land of the living. So this is why in Isaiah chapter 61, which is a prophetic announcement of what we like to call the good news of salvation. Isaiah 61. It's a prophetic announcement. It's the good news of salvation. What it is that Jesus is coming to establish and once he establishes it, what will be the consequence of that establishment? If what Jesus wants to do finds expression in the earth, what will be the consequence? And he goes further and in verse 4. He says, those people who were poor, those people who were sick, those people who were lame, those people who were captives, those people who were oppressed, the minute I have brought them to my side, he says, they, 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 the same weaklings, the same poor people, the same captives that are now free, they shall build the old rings. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the cities, the desolations of many generations. So when you look at a family and you find desolation that has existed from one generation, to the next. It is because the priesthood of darkness has found express license to function within that lineage. The solution is not just tears. The solution is the rising of a priest of light. When a priest of light rises that is willing to pay the same kind of sacrifices that those of darkness paid to institute such an order then deliverance can find expression. So if you listen to the kind of prayers that Amanda was leading us to pray, you will find out that the reason it looks as if we are engaged in many activity and we are not yielding results is because the people in the negative supernatural are willing to go any length, any length to establish wickedness. But the average Christian Anything that looks like discomfort, anything that affects their sleep, anything that affects their physical comfort, they are, they are quick to resist it, quick to push it back, quick to turn their backs away from it and say, I have tried. Meanwhile, those in the negative supernatural can stay on him for 30 years, consistently monitoring it, waiting for an opening. Because when you read the scriptures, and you begin to see the effects of, of, of wickedness upon a territory, you hear words like waste places. That's what the King James is translating as ruins, ruined cities. Waste places. He's talking about places that have become dry and barren. No life exists there. Then you begin to hear things like breach. A breach speaks about an opening in an otherwise secured environment that Satan can now take advantage of. Most of the time, before places become waste, places will first of all be breached. It is the breach that now guarantees, that provides license for the enemy to invade and reduce an otherwise beautiful city to a wasteland. 
Because the metaphor that Isaiah is using here is the metaphor of Jerusalem. When Jerusalem was invaded, in Jerusalem, her walls were burned down. The once beautiful city, the Zion of Israel, was reduced to a place of ruin. A place of desolation. That's how some families have been reduced. People rose up within the enclave of that family and decided that everybody in that lineage will suffer. And they did it by consistently servicing an altar. Then we get born again and think we just want to come to church and shout hallelujah. Meanwhile, every time you sleep in the night, we find out that a demon, irrespective of your fasting, still comes to claim legal right over your body. When you look at that female entity in the dream and you say, you don't own me, she shouts back at you and says, you are my property. And you think it is normal. You think it's normal. You are a young man, you lie down to sleep, you suddenly feel the weight of a presence. You know what I'm saying. Within you, what is giving this spirit such legal right with all your tongues? Is the realm of the spirit is not emotional. The realm of the spirit is legalistic. It operates by laws, principles, patterns. If a law has been established in the spirit and it has been effectively serviced and that altar has now been licensed to execute the covenants between the, 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 the servant at that altar and the spirit that he services, that altar will become so potent if another man does not rise up that can initiate and institute something of the same nature that can put it back, it will look as if you are born again and you cannot advance. Even Jesus told us, nobody can spoil a, a strong man's house except you first know how to do what? Bind the strong man. You want to walk into his house to take his goods, to deliver your brother. You have wept over your brother. You have... The thing that is doing your brother is ancient. It's a former desolation. If you don't know how to travel, travel in the spirit and confront that thing as old as it is, you'll be looking at your family becoming desolate, becoming, becoming a wasteland. So what priesthood is really is your ability to discover where did the breach occur? Where did it occur? Where did it occur? This is why you will notice when God wanted to punish his people, he will say, because you have done this, you have played the harlot at every high place. I have now turned my back. He wanted them to know this is where the breach occurred. If you can correct the breach, you can change the trajectory of your life. So once they identified it, they will go and repent and say, okay, Lord, we are sorry. We did this. We did this. We did this. We did that. What they are doing is repairing the breach. Once there is a breach, Satan knows that he has access. Go to the next verse. Go to verse 5. Let me show you something in verse 6. Go to verse 5. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Once a repair arises, once a builder arises, one who is the priest of light, working in partnership with God to see that the good news of salvation is established in their family. I taught you before, in our first 40 days of the year, I taught you. I said deliverance is only possible because salvation has been provided. If there is no salvation, without the salvific work of, right, of Christ, sorry, nobody can claim to be delivered. The reason the Bible says that even the lawful captive shall be set free is because a sacrifice, a superior sacrifice has been presented in the courts of heaven. So once you can partner with the Lord, you can appropriate that sacrifice to your life because it's thing to know something is yours positionally is another thing to leave it on a daily basis in reality. We are all seated with Christ in heavenly places far above principalities and powers. That's your positional reality. But to make it your practical reality in your daily expressions will take priesthood. You will need to know how to align. That's why the Bible says when you enter into the heavens there's an infrastructure you will see. 
you will see the altar. And upon that altar, the lamb as if he was just slain. So the sacrifice existed before the foundation of the earth because the Bible says that he was slain before the foundation of the earth. The sacrifice was executed within time. Jesus came and became our Passover lamb. That's why when Paul, John saw him, he pointed to him. He said, behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the whole world. But that sacrifice is treated in the temple. It's a sustained reality so that when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior in the earth, you now have a basis by which you can align with heaven to enforce what it is that that sacrifice has instituted for you. It's not enough to say, I am now a child of God. All things have passed away. All things have become new. If you don't have any problem in your bloodline, you will not understand what we are talking about. If you've not encountered the works of darkness, you will not understand what I'm talking about. You will find out that positive confession is not enough. There is a deliberate commitment to confront Satan. You will be deliberate about it. Deliberate. That's why a woman could be the daughter of Abraham. The one in bloodline where there were promises and blessings. But she, was, she, was, she had a spirit of infirmity that crippled her life. When Elijah said to Gehazi, eh? when he said, Elisha said to Gehazi, that oh, not only you, but your entire lineage will become leprous. You think it was a joke? Immediately that curse was released. People born into Gehazi's family, the women would just have noticed that every child they give birth to is leprous. Even if the child was not aware of what transpired in in eternity past. That's why the sacrifice is in eternity past. The sacrifice of Jesus is in eternity present. And the sacrifice of Jesus is in eternity future. Is there. So that blood can go to your past. The lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. That blood can walk in your present. That blood can go into your future. So if there are things that have been programmed into your future, you will just notice in certain families, once all the men become 40, they have kidney problem. The minute they strike 40, they have kidney problem. In some families, go and check. All the men have died. They died at 45. One has escaped. He's now 56. But poverty. Hmm. Poverty has retooled his life that it would have been better that he died. There's a cycle that has been initiated. He says, once you understand your role in the activities, the interplay that happen in the invisible realm, he said, even strangers shall stand and feed your flock. And the sons of the foreigner shall be your plowman and your vine dressers because that same ruined city will begin to produce fruit. Oh, you are not here. That same ruined city, a, 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 a garden will begin to grow there. A garden. You that was that you went full and you came back empty, all of a sudden, even foreigners will become the people that God is using to help you. Have you not read that scripture in Isaiah? He says, He commanded a raven. Oh man, a raven to come from a far country. He called it a stranger, a stranger, a man from a far country to come and do his bidding. Is bidding. Your location in life is not the problem. The question is have channels been opened for God to reach you where you are? But he can command a raven to come. A raven can, can be commanded just as he commanded ravens and feed Elijah. Media, find that scripture for me. He called it a raven. It's in Isaiah somewhere. And a man from a far country to come and perform his counsel. It's in the Bible. Eh? What is it? 60. Is it Isaiah 60? 60. Verse what? Isaiah 60. The media can't find that scripture. Let me find it. It's an Isaiah. I don't, I can't remember where it is. Aha. Uh -huh. 4611. Isaiah 4611. 
Isaiah 46, 11. Let me show you before I dive. Isaiah 46, 11. Calling a bed of prey. That's a raven. Because a, a, what, what he calls a bed of prey is a, is a ravenous bed. A bed that feeds on meat and other beds. A raven normally is a, is a scavenger. A scavenger. He calls a bed of prey from the east. A man who executes his, his counsel from where? A far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have proposed it. And what will happen? I will do it. I will do it. So the Lord can command the ravens. This scripture is telling you that that thing that happened to Isaiah and um, um, to Elijah is not unique to Elijah. It can happen to you. He can call a ravenous beast. He can call a bed of prey. He can call a raven from, a, from the east. The reason you are not experiencing such benevolence of supply is that channels are blocked in the spirit. It will take a priest of light to bust them up. Because once you close a breach in the spirit, the thing is that in closing that breach against Satan, you are opening the vows to the Holy Ghost. So once his government is established, everything that is associated with the Holy Spirit will begin to find expression in your life. Go back to Isaiah 61. Let's go to verse 6. Verse 6. But you shall be named what? The priests of the Lord. Notice it says, but you. While strangers are tending to your flocks, while foreigners are plowing your garden, your commitment is not the business. You are not hearing me. But you, strangers, they will be focusing on ensuring that your economic situation is attended to. But your primary assignment is not your economic situation. Are you seeing the scripture? Your primary assignment is what? Priesthood. But you shall be named the priest of the Lord. They, who is they? The foreigners, the strangers. They shall do what? Call you the servants of our God. You are in his service, doing his bidding. I don't know whether I taught you explicitly, but by the time you look through scriptures, you will find out that the priest actually has three major functions. Number one, the priest was to minister. He's the one that is authorized by God to minister sacred things. He was authorized by God to minister. That word minister simply means to be in the Lord's service. Concerning sacred things. Number two, the priest was the one who offered sacrifices at the altar. So even if they did not put security guards to guard the altar. It was an abomination for anybody else to approach the altar to perform sacrifice. This is why when they were on the mountain and Saul was about to go to war and he gathered the people to himself, Samuel said to him, wait until I get there. And Saul became impatient and decided to step out of his office to engage in a responsibility he didn't have license to. The kingdom was taken from him. What's the name of that other king that died a leper? Uzziah. Same thing with Uzziah. He felt that because he was king, he could preach protocol. Sacrifice to the Lord was the sole responsibility of the priest. Number three, the priest was a mediator between man and and God. He was a mediator between man and God. So he stood between man and God. And in his responsibilities to God, in his responsibilities to God, he made sure that he maintained a state of holiness, consecration, and sanctification. Without maintaining that state, and I taught you last week that there are tools to help you maintain that state as a priest. Without maintaining that state, he cannot receive from the Lord. 
He cannot receive mysteries because he needs to be spiritually educated. There's an educational system that occurs in the priest's service to the Lord. As he's ministering unto the Lord, he receives education. Based on that education, his second responsibility was to teach the people. Let me show you something. Give me Ezekiel 44. Give me verse 15. Ezekiel 44 verse 15. Let me show you something. I feel fire tonight. I wish, I wish it was Viji. I, I feel like praying. But the priest, the Levites, the son of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall do what? Come near to me to do what? Minister to me. And they shall stand before me to offer me to me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. Next verse. They shall enter my sanctuary and they shall come near my table to minister to me and they shall keep my charge. What is the table here? The table here is not the table of shoe bread. The table here is the altar. The altar. We don't have the time. When you get to Malachi chapter 1, is it verse is it verse 11 now? I can't remember. But the Bible says that he called the sacrifice his food. And he called the altar his table. And what I actually want to teach tonight is the tools for the altar. We've dealt with the tools for the priest. We need to understand the tools for the altar. So when the priest is engaging with an altar, what he's actually doing is that he's preparing the Lord's table. Because every time sacrifice comes upon the altar, how does the Bible describe it? It says the Lord did what? Consumed it. So a fire will come from the presence of the Lord and do what? Consume the sacrifice. So the sacrifice was the Lord's food. This is why Paul in Romans chapter 12 calls your presenting your body as a living sacrifice. He calls it acceptable worship. So the Lord consumes you. You've heard us say it many times. If God does not have all of you, he does not have you at all. All of you, he consumes you. That's why in Hebrews, he's called a what? Consuming fire. I taught you last week. He consumes your passions. All of you. You are his food. He eats you up. That's why the, the metaphor that is used in scripture to describe Jesus says, zeal for your house did what? Consumed me. He ate me up from the inside. Me no rest. So he says, they shall come near to my table to minister to me. Verse 17. And it shall be that whenever they enter the gates of the inner court, that they shall put on linen garments. No wool shall come upon them while they minister within the gates of the inner court or within the house. Remember, outer court ministry is to the people. Are you with me? Outer court ministry is to the people. And you may not like some of the things that I say. There are people who have big crowds and they still have titles. There are some who even have small crowds and they still have titles. Their ministry is outer court ministry. God doesn't want to see them. Because within their hearts, their obsession is the people. How to feed the people. So they, they build messages in the altar that satisfy the lust of the people. It is the needs of the people that determine what they preach on a weekly basis. So 450 spinsters for 560 bachelors. Grace to get visa. Oga, oga. So the, the body now is for visa. So we need grace to get visa. That is what a whole church will come and do for one week. Praying. Pounding heaven for grace to get visa. So every program is either how people should marry, how people should get children, how to get a job, favor. So people even take their CV. They want to apply to a company. They go for an anointing service. They pour olive oil on the CV and submit it to a company. They will put your, your, your they will use it as tissue paper. Pour olive oil on the CV because we are obsessed, obsessed with the things that the Gentiles seek after. It's not me. Don't be angry with me. I just read the Bible. I'm the way I am because of scriptures. 
He says, these are the things that the Gentiles do what? Seek after. But you do what? Seek ye first the kingdom. He says, it's when your priorities are right, every other thing will be what? Added. You will not need to pray for it. What will happen? It will be added. It will be added. So we are, the body of Christ is pursuing additions. Meanwhile, the burdens of the kingdom are suffering. So that's why fake prophets are rising within our territory. Everybody is desperate for somebody to see for them. What happened to your own eyes? I taught you here, every Christian must be apostolic. You live with a certain mentality. Every Christian must be evangelistic. Your life must become an instrument to actualize the mission of the kingdom. Every Christian must be prophetic. You, are, you become conscious of the realm where God dwells and you reference that realm to live in this realm. You align with that realm. So you should be able to see for yourself. Somebody says you are wearing green underwear. Hey, so you don't remember what you wore from the house. You need reminder. The reason they are running is that many people have become obsessed with outer court ministry. Their focus is the people. But God said, the minute you cross the gates, the gates there was simply a veil separating between the outer court and the inner court. He said, the minute you cross it, you must do what? Put on lenient garments. No wool should come out there. You know why? Wool had the ability to soak sweat. So God did not want any sign of defilement in the inner court. So let your garment always be white. And let your head lack no ointment. So your first ministry as you enter into the inner court is that you must be holy, you must be sanctified, you must be consecrated to minister unto him. If not, the gift in your hand will be rejected. Not necessarily because the gift is bad, but because the man is not authorized. Are you with me? So he says concerning Cain that the Lord rejected Cain. The first point of rejection was the man. He rejected Cain and then he rejected what? His offering. That's not always the case. Some people, the offering in their hand is good. But the man can be rejected. So God will say, Alex, that if you bring your offering to the Lord's table, to the altar, and you find out, you remember that somebody has ought against you. He says, don't proceed because the offering might be good. But if you proceed in that state, the offering will be a waste. So Yahoo boys, internet frosters that are going to church to drop offering, eh? they are wasting their time. They can't buy their way to heaven. The priority of God is not the offering. First is the man. How are you coming? Have you worn a wool garment that has trapped all the impurities from your flesh? And the thing about that thing is that once it has soaked your sweat to that level, it will bring a stench. God doesn't want that smell of your humanity and your corruption within the gates of the inner God. So he says, when you bring your thing to the altar, not that you are angry with somebody, you remember that somebody is angry with you. Whether legitimately or illegitimately, the Bible does not say, oh, whether the person is correct or not, you just remember, oh, my brother has something against me. He said, don't proceed. Don't advance. Don't advance. Because if you enter into the realm of the spirit to attempt to do business like that, it will be a casualty. Normally, if the priest breach this protocol, he will die. He will pay with his life. So when you live with your wife at home and certain things begin to happen, that's how married people live that have grown wise. They make sure that there's no quarrel. My wife will tell you, I, we, we began to tell ourselves as husband and wife that the environment in this house, the fragile peace that we enjoy, there's no price too high to pay for it. So some useless things should not bring argument because Satan cannot penetrate you unless there is a breach. You must break the law. Create an opening for him to enter. So you that is just looking at naked pictures, you call it comedy. You think that you think that you are entertaining your flesh. You are creating a breach. 
You can't go beyond the gates from the outer court into the inner court with wool. You must enter in linen. In your priestly garment of sanctification, of consecration, and of separation. Next verse. They shall have linen turbans on their heads, linen trousers on their bodies. They shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes what? Sweat. So you see what I'm saying? Nothing that causes sweat. Next verse. When they go out to the outer court, to the outer court to who? The people. That's the ministry of the outer court. They shall take off their garments. So the minute you are also coming out of the inner court, back to the outer court, you remove the linen. Because that thing, if you heard what Amanda said, very profound, my heart leapt in my spirit. That there's a, a king, many kingly initiations that you see. Why is it that in every kingly initiation, ascension to the throne, they will say that the king should go and be somewhere for some days, alone. Nobody will be there with him, alone. They want him to have intercourse with the ancestors, with the spirits. And no king will come out to tell you what happened in that room. Have you noticed? You can be a, an indigenous of that village. You will only be guessing. You will never know the details in that room. That's how priesthood functions. There are things that are supposed to happen to you behind the veil. Eh? That no mortal can know. That even if you know it, you understand it, you will not have the vocabulary to communicate it. I've said to you here many times, there are encounters that if I share, you will think is a lie. So, we don't have privilege to share it. Because the preaching of the gospel is not your experience, it's the Bible. You don't use your experience to establish doctrine. So, encounters are not, are not part of the gospel. I'm just saying to you that if you share some things, you will not believe. You will not believe. And that's why we will not share them. It's not necessary. It's not going to help you love Jesus. It's not, for some of you, it might create a loss. This generation says, oh, 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 oh. So give, give me that encounter or I die. Oh God, you are, you are in love with the wrong thing. With the wrong thing. So he says, as you are coming out from the inner court, back there, drop the priestly garments. They are things. So sometimes, God will give you a dream. Not so that you can call the person to say, uh, uh, um, Sister, Sister Tokumbo, um, I woke up as usual to do my priesthood. Oga, 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 Oga. That garment is a private matter. The reason God involved you in that cycle it's not so that you can become flippant. That's why many of you have lost the oil. Your eyes have become dim. You no longer see clearly. Because you are a talkative. You don't know when to put a line between inner court ministry and outer court ministry. It's not everything the priest saw there that he came to tell the people in the outer court. So sometimes when God gives you a vision, if he impresses on your heart to say it, then you say it. If he does not, sometimes you just need to inform other people and say, let's raise a prayer for this sister. You might not even give details. But you begin to clock prayer. Balakai. Libro Shata. Then one day the sister will come and share testimony. She will not know that it is your altar that powered the change. Intercession is lonely. If you are not in love with being invisible, you cannot be an intercessor. You know all these ones we do, 10 hours, 15 hours, 900 hours, 72 hours, that is in the public. That's not the main thing. No. God is showing you that the main life of this priest is a hidden life. It's secret life. It's on a level of intimacy that there are protocols you must not breach. If you breach it, he will remove the authority. Remember, the priest is the one that is authorized to minister sacred things. Next verse. Next verse. They shall neither shave their heads nor let their hair grow long, but they shall keep their hair well trimmed. These are consecration matters. 21. No priest shall drink wine when he enters the inner court. 22. They shall not take as wife a widow 
or a divorced woman, but take virgins of the descendants of the house of Israel or widows of priests. I've taught this before. There's no need. Next verse, 23. And what's the last thing? And they shall do what? Teach my people. So after they have learned the protocols of dealing with him on this level, then when they have well educated on how the mind of God works, then they shall do what? Teach my people. So he's a mediator between God and man. What does he teach them? The difference between the holy and the unholy and cause them to do what? Discern. Oh my God, no time. It's almost seven. If I enter that discernment matter now, eh? we will not be able to go. One of the biggest challenges with modern day Christianity is a lack of discernment. We don't know who a man of God is. Sometimes I see the places people go and sit down. Like I was telling them in Ghana some days ago. I said, the day must come when, when somebody stands on the pulpit and is doing something strange. Carry your Bible. Now they Obo, Zobo. One said that the stone that David used to kill Goliath, he, he has it. Eh? That you should come and buy. The stone. They sent me one video today. I had to delete it. I was angry. I was irritated. The preacher was holding star lager. Star lager. Star lager bear. And everybody in the church came to church with one bottle of star lager. You know the prayer point? He read the writings on the bear. He said, the star shining. He said, let your star begin to shine. Then everybody held lager. Lager. Demons in the pulpit. Demons. Mad people. Colors with titles. And people are got there. It's because there is no priest to teach them how to discern. Our discernment has become corrupted because what the priests are feeding the people does not train them to know what is sacred and what is common, what is holy, and what is unholy. So the average person cannot discern. Churches are full, but they are blind men, deaf women, hearts that have been inflamed with the lusts of this world. Say, they walk, oh. they walk. That's why we have songs like, they walk. And they flow. They shine. Ever since I met Jesus, money, 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 money. We car and sisters dancing everywhere. What's the difference between that and the man that Alex? Have you thought about it? What's the difference between that and those that sing for the world? What do they advertise in their videos? Is it not sex? Is it not money? Is it not cars? Is it not clothes? What's the difference? That's why we cannot discern. The average Christian, their heart is inflamed with the passions of this world. And the consequence is that families are suffering. You've been born again 10 years. You cannot repair the ruins and the desolations of generations. God thought that if he gets you saved, your younger brother will be saved. Now your younger brother is worse than before. And you have not laid down to weep. Not laid down to cry. Your heart is inflamed with a loss. They can't discern. Give me 22, 26. Ezekiel 22, 26. Ezekiel 22, 26. Her priests have done what? Violated my law. And profaned my holy things. They have not what? Distinguished between the holy and unholy. Nor have they made the diff known the difference between the unclean and the clean. They have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. Priest of light, the day to rise is now. There must be a clear distinction between the holy and unholy, the sacred and the common. Your eyes must not be hidden from the Lord's Sabbath. You must wear your toga of priesthood and labor until your generation changes. 
you must enter into that temple and weep between the pew and the altar. And let your tears become a weight in the scale that the hand of the divine will not be able to ignore your petitions. What did Anna know? What did she know? Immediately her husband died. Luke chapter 3. Is it 3 now? Or is 2? 2, 36, 37. Immediately her husband died. She, she abandoned herself in the temple. And the Bible describes her as praying day and night with fasting. I was listening to my father in the Lord sharing a testimony about a woman. 28 years or so, if I get the age correctly. She had been married to her husband for six years. Immediately her husband died. They were begging her to remarry. She said no. That God has told her that that is the only years of marriage she will have. This woman is not a pastor. This woman is not a preacher. My father in the Lord said she's a sanctuary keeper. She cleans chairs. That before she comes to clean chairs, she will pray eight hours. To clean chair. To wash toilet. And you don't know how hard it is to wash toilet. You need to see the way some brothers use toilet. It's as if they have four bomb bomb. When they sit down like this, the, 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 the thing comes from this side. So it's everywhere. She will pray eight hours to engage in washing toilet. Then you will come and sit down there. When you sit on the seat, then so suddenly you have an encounter. You think you are a strong man. You don't know that there's a woman who is not visible. She's like Anna. Day and night. Day and night. Strangers feed my flocks. Foreigners, they water my gardens. But me, my calling is to the altar. It's my calling. This is why you must know the tools of the altar because if you are a priest and you don't first understand your calling, you are already a waste of time and space. God cannot use you to advance his agenda in a generation that is dying. A generation that is under the government of darkness, corruption, death, immorality will pass out in their death and corruption because God cannot find a man who understands that he so there must first be the understanding that I am called to priesthood. Now when you have that understanding, then you now know how to function at the altar. What are the tools for the altar? Because my time is up. I'm just going to go quickly so you can study. Number one, the first tool of the altar is understanding. Understanding. And what do I mean by understanding? You must know how to engage at the altar. You must know how to engage at the altar. You cannot put the wrong sacrifice on the right altar. And you cannot put the right sacrifice on the wrong altar. Why dear brother? The altar of incense was for incense. It will be madness for a priest to go and put a bull on that altar. And the altar of burnt offering was for burnt offering. It will be foolishness and a breach of protocol for a priest to go and put incense on that altar. So you must be spiritually educated. And that is why your first ministry is unto God. We don't go to prayer so that we can come and boast to people that we pray. We don't go to prayer so that we can receive something to share with people so that it looks as if we are prophetic. Our first ministry in prayer is intimacy. I taught you in one of the parts that the reason the priest is unique is that he's one that is obsessed with the presence of God. He's supposed to be a mobile router of divine presence. So you must understand. You must know the protocols of the altar. And the way you will come into that education is as you make contact with God. You make contact with God. You make contact with God. He will begin to teach you. Just the way Moses was giving Aaron instructions. No, don't wear wool, wear linen. When you come, there's a time for the morning sacrifice. There's a time for the evening sacrifice. There's a way to sacrifice it. When you've even put the, the bull there, before you put the bull, you must remove all the inner parts of it. It must be washed. Are you with me? So the first two is understanding. So as you engage with God, seek understanding. Number two, the second tool is sacrifice. We are not coming with bulls and with goats. 
But one of the major things you will sacrifice as you walk at the altar as a priest is time. If your altar is going to become potent, you must give time to it. I can't deal with that now, but just go and read scriptures. You will find out that altars need to be built. Altars are never accidental. They must be built. The minute Noah came out of the ark, the Bible says he built an altar. Genesis 13. Abraham, the Bible says, he decided that he will return to the place where he made an altar to the Lord. So it must be made. It must be built. Altars require time to build. So if you are not prepared to give time to this thing, you will not have a potent altar. You must sacrifice time. So it's in Matthew 26 now that Jesus says to the disciples, could you not watch with me for what? One hour. Only one hour. Everybody in this tent, by now, by now, if you've been here since we started RCN, you should at least in your private time be able to do at least one hour consistently. By now, at least one hour consistently. You should not be in the category of people saying, I don't know, when I start praying, I get tired, I get tired. Then you do 15 minutes and say, are you brushing your teeth? You, you, you do the time, you, lab, you labor, you labor at least one hour. And I've taught you before, if you stay in that one hour consistently, one day you will come to do one hour and just find out you can do two hours. At that day, you will know you have grown because you don't force this thing. It's not by power. I told you the fire must be ignited by the Lord. You will just notice that it has become, there's a button to stretch this thing. And that day you will know you have grown. It will now become a sin for you in that day to continue doing one hour. Because grace has been supplied for you to take it a little further. Third, third, third tool for the altar. Covenant. What did I call it? I can't hear you. What did I call it? Covenant. Covenant. And in covenant, we are now talking about things like consistency and routine. Give me Psalm 50 and verse 5 as I want to close. Consistency and the routine. Covenant. 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 That's where you begin. Like this 120 days, dear brothers and sisters, is a covenant. We are entering it went with the Lord. The Lord says, come and pray. And we said, how long? He said, 120 days. And we said, we are ready. So we entered into a covenant. The proof that you have begun to deal at the altar by covenant is that when you make commitments, you abide by it. You abide by it. So this is why, don't be in a hurry to say, when you hear prayer, meet, you, you hear teachings like this, and as you are going home, say, Lord, every day, from now, five hours, I vow, I vow with my soul, <laughs> Holy Moko. Then you get home. After eating your fufu. I ate Ghana fufu in Ghana. And the way their fufu is, they put it inside. I, I even had to send my wife the video. They put it inside one kind of pepper soup. Then you eat from inside. My God. Levulaba. After you have eaten fufu at 10.30. And wasted about one hour on WhatsApp. When it's 11.55, you say, ah, I go soon pray. Let me sleep small. Let me sleep small. From 5 minutes to 12 to 5.30 in the morning. And you know people pray in their imagination. Before they fall asleep, they do. Kabelo, come While they are sleeping, they'll be seeing themselves praying. No? They at 5.30, they'll just wake up. La, ba, ba, ba. You say I prayed five hours. Oh God, oh God. <laughs> it was in your dream. You didn't pray. You didn't pray. Because prayer is not, is not sleeping. You must mount words. You must mount words. And when you are trying to build your altar, sometimes you might suffer distractions. You might suffer distractions. 
when you are trying to be consistent, to build time, to build time. So how do you under, handle distractions when you are praying? One of the ways you can handle distractions when you are praying is number one. First of all, approach prayer with an objective. Have a focus area. That okay, what am I doing? This one hour, is it to build fellowship? This one hour, am I coming to pray for a wife? This one hour, am I praying for my business? What is that time for? Establish an objective. Once you have established an objective, it's best that if you are praying on a specific matter, begin by praying in your understanding. Because the Bible is very clear. When you pray in the spirit, your mind is unfruitful. But when you pray in your understanding, you cannot pray words without your thoughts getting involved. Are you with me? So if you are praying in your understanding, I decided to pray with some of my sons last night. I came out and they will tell you, people who have prayed with me, they know. I can do two hours in my understanding. Two hours. And most of the time, I'm just thanking God. And I'm quoting scriptures. This is why you must be a student of the Bible. You must be a student of the Bible. If you want your prayer to be effective, I told you one of the tools of the priest is the word of God. So beginning your understanding, Lord, I have come because I want to fellowship with you. The Bible says anyone who comes to you, you will in no wise cast out. Lord, I am here. Lord, I am here. Lord, I am here. Look upon me with mercy. Guide my hearts. Take over my thoughts. I don't want to waste time. I came that I might find you. Oh Lord, hide not your face from me. You said when I seek you, I will find you when I seek you with all of my heart. Who is he that can ascend the holy hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? He that had clean hands, a pure heart. Lord, I know I'm not perfect, so I ask for your mercy. My approach tonight is an approach of mercy. You said you will have mercy upon whom you will have mercy. You continue to build. You can do that thing for six hours. For six hours. So, when you find that you are doing that thing and your mind is going to certain places, you now convert those thoughts that are entering into your mind to prayer points. If there are not thoughts that can be converted to prayer points, pray with a notepad. That's how I overcame my own. So if something jumps into your mind and you are praying in your understanding, it might be that the Holy Ghost is saying, pray on this matter. You can touch it. The minute you will find out, the minute you deal with it in prayer, it goes. If it is not a matter that is related directly to what you are praying about, you might write it and say, Holy Spirit, I have realized that you want me to deal with this, then focus. Immediately, it leaves your mind to the paper. You deal with it. Are you with me tonight? Then when you are praying in your understanding, make the switch to praying in tongues. Allow it to be organic. When you begin to feel it in your belly that you should pray in tongues, begin to pray in tongues. Now when you are praying in tongues and those distractions are still coming, it's possible that it's the Holy Ghost trying to say, deal with this matter, deal with this matter. The same principles apply. Are you with me? If not, you, you will kneel down that you are, you are, you are speaking in tongues. Go, go, go. go, go. Get, get, get. And all you have been thinking about is who won the Euro 2024. Say, so messy leg can't swell up. Ah, beans, not the house. Beans, beans. And they like beans. So. so when I leave the tent now, and people are doing, see you like, but your mind is in a market. Right? So if you are worried, oh, no food, put it down. Put it down. Then continue to pray. It will get to a point that that thing becomes wood that you put in the fire. It becomes part of the prayer. You initiate it. Or you are praying and somebody's name enters your mind. You are just praying and all of a sudden, brother, Obiora enters you. Obiora, Obiora, Obiora. Immediately begin to pray for him. Lord, I don't know what is happening to my brother now. I don't know where he is, his wife, his children. Lord, preserve them. Oh Lord, is there something you want me to deal with specifically? Marakadai, Duza Baranish. As you are speaking in tongues, something might come. His health, his health, his health. Oh Lord, I stand in the gap. That's how we do intercession. 
Are you with me? Otherwise, you will just get frustrated. You will say, my mind is always wandering. And Satan knows that if you are absent-minded, you are not really praying. Prayer must consume all of you. I've taught this before. Your spirit, your soul, and your body. Have you been blessed tonight? Bow your heads and ask the Lord, give me grace. Oh, when I leave this world, I will go in prayer. I came by prayer. I will stay in prayer. Oh, oh, oh. when I leave this world, I will go in prayer. I will pray. I will pray. I, uh, I will pray. 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 Yeah. Oh, I will pray. I will pray. I will pray. Make a commitment to God tonight. I will serve at your altar. I will labor at your table. Ensure that there is a sacrifice daily, daily on my altar. Daily on my altar. trusting you that such great things will be done. That indeed the former desolations will be restored. The ancient ruins will be repaired. That indeed we will be priests of light. And by our consistency, our commitment, our labors, Lord, your kingdom will advance in our day. And the name of Jesus will be glorified. Thank you, Holy Ghost. For in Jesus' awesome name, we have prayed. Come on, I said in Jesus' name, we have prayed. Quickly, if you came with an offering, you can give it.